gracious, loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that we can indeed lay down our burdens onto you. And God, we give you thanks for all those places in our lives in the past where we can see you carry our burdens, and that is why we know. And God, we give you thanks for the places in our lives right now where you are carrying our burdens and so that we don't have to. And so, God, we come to you knowing our history together. We come to you now with those burdens that are on our hearts right now, those places where we are hurting, those people who we seek healing for. We come to you on, with bended hearts knowing what you have done before, knowing what you can do again. In particular, we lift up Sandra and Eric and Angela and Rhonda and all who are suffering from cancer. We lift up Ed and we pray for his healing. We lift up the Larson family uh, for pain in their joints and nerves to subside. We lift up praise. We give thanks uh, for Chris's girlfriend's Whitney's. Uh, we give you, thank for, give you thanks for Whitney's new job, God, we pray. We give you thanks for places where there has been One that time. breakthrough. Thanks, Siri. Anytime. Um, we also lift up our mission trip um, and our uh, vacation Bible school. Uh, we give you thanks, O oh Lord, uh, that we are seeing the signups. Uh, we are seeing folks wanting to get involved, wanting to love and serve in that way. We lift up certainly the community of Eastland as we prepare to go there. Uh, we pray for this trip that we may be a part of your love. Uh, God, I remember what it was to watch folks descend on my city. Um, the city of Houston after Harvey and feeling that love and knowing that that love came from you. And so, God, I pray that we can be that same thing for Eastland. I lift up our dear brother Stacy, uh, who is in uh, intensive care um, in Longview. Uh, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And so, God, we pray for clarity and for wisdom for the doctors. And, God, we pray uh, for healing uh, for Stacy that he uh, may be made well. Um, God, we lift up the ongoing situation in Ukraine, and we lift up the ongoing coronavirus a pandemic, we lift up whatever is on our hearts, whatever it is that is weighing us down. God, we lift that up and hand that over to you, knowing that in you we can come to you however we are and know that you will carry our burdens. God, we give you thanks for the second chance love that we have received from you. God, we know we still fall short of you and even in that, we know that there is grace from you for us in abundance through the sacrifice of Christ. And so, God, may we take this second chance and, as ever, run with it in ministry. And we may go out into the world and be your hands and your feet. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. I invite uh, the children to come forward, and I invite Pastor Emily to come forward uh, for a message prepared just for the kids. So I suspect we'll have fun, too. Up today... Um, actually, everybody's going to get the help today. Okay, so who wants to be my first volunteer helper? Okay, so we're going to have you stand right over here. Let's see. Let's let Jay, will you hold this right here? Uh-huh. So you're going to hold it up so everybody can see it. Can you be real tall? Perfect. Everybody can see, right? All right. Okay, now let's see. I'm going to let you pour first. Okay, so this is our life, right? And it's all clean and wonderful and beautiful, right? Would y'all take a drink of this water? It looks pretty refreshing, right? Looks pretty clean. Okay, but sometimes some stuff can come into our life, right? So you have to be real careful not to spill, but pour a little bit of it in there, just a tiny bit. Okay, a little more. All right, now hold it up real tall, Jay. What do you think? It's yellow. Okay, now hand it over to Renee. Okay, so sometimes when we sin and we mess up, our lives aren't as clean anymore, right? And there was a guy named Saul who was persecuting Christians. Go ahead and pour a little more in there for me. He was arresting Christians even. He was not making good choices, right? Okay. Thomas, do you want to put a little in there too? Or you want to wait till the next one? Okay. All right. Very carefully put a little bit in there. You can put in a little, a lot of it. How about that? Okay. A little more. Keep going. All right, you can set that right over there, Thomas. Thank you. Okay, hold it up now. Would you want to take a drink of that, Jay? Nah, -uh, it's not so clean anymore, right? But did you know that when Jesus comes along, okay, so this one's Jesus. Jesus can make us all clean again. So I'm going to let you pour some Jesus in there, but you're going to have to hold it up real tall so everybody can see what happens, okay? You ready? So what happens when Jesus comes into our life? 
It makes it all clean again, right? And Jesus can take the sin in our life. But what if, I don't know, could Jesus do that for all the sin of the world? What do you think? You want to pour some Jesus in here and see what happens? Let's see. Whoa, keep on keeping on. Yeah. So Jesus, when Jesus went to the cross, he can change us completely. And Jesus completely changed Saul's life. He went from persecuting Christians and arresting them to becoming a really awesome Christian guy and helping everybody out. Isn't that fun? Pretty cool, huh? You can pour some more in there? All right. Thank you, Jay. All right. That's good. Let's go ahead and set them right back over here. Isn't that fun? All right, guys. Let's come over here. Let's uh, close our eyes, bow our heads, put our hands together, and let's pray. Will you guys pray after me? All right. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us all clean from the sin in our lives. Thank you for changing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is indeed uh, the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, Acts the Apostles, uh, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was, excuse me. <coughs> now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there, there, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At, the mo at this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, we spend an absurd amount of money and an absurd amount of time attempting to make ourselves better. The health and wellness category, which does not include medical spending, but just like uh, gym memberships, diet plans, face creams, and vitamins. This is the vague sketch of the health and wellness category of the, of the global economy is $1.5 trillion. The people of the world spend $1.5 trillion attempting to make themselves healthy. Again, via pills and creams and diet plans and gym memberships that we may or may not be using. I'm going to get to that statistic in a second. Um, 
On top of that, the American uh, market for self-help stuff, that's self-help books, self-help seminars, self-help podcasts, the like, actualize yourself, be your best self today. All the people with the book covers with the really smiley faces who have definitely had work done both to their teeth and to their faces, all of those books represent $11.5 bill, an $11.5 billion industry. Americans spend $11.5 billion on self-help related material. Okay, that's a lot. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you two charts and these two charts say the same thing um, and that is that we are not getting any thinner. We are just, as Americans, and I'm not, call, this is, I'm not calling anybody fat, I'm just saying that all this money we are spending on gym memberships and pills and diet plans isn't working. Uh, obesity is on the rise. All of, those, all of those lines represent an increase in obesity. The only numbers going down are for overweight men, and that is merely because obese men are on the rise, and they are eating, literally eating up uh, the overweight men as they go. Why this is, is you can spend all the money you want on a gym membership. That doesn't mean you're going to go. You can spend all the money you want monthly to Weight Watchers, and Lord knows I do, but if you do not participate in the program, merely paying the monthly fee will not help you lose weight. You can intake all of the vitamins in the world, but if you do not get up off your couch and you are eating pork rinds the whole time, it will negate the power of vitamin D to do anything in your life. The hardest thing about losing weight has nothing to do with the diet plan or the gym membership or the creams or the pills. It is because behavior change is almost impossible. When a habit becomes a habit, it is almost impossible to break. One of the hardest things for any human to do is to change their own behavior. One of the hardest things for another human to do is to attempt to change the behavior of another person. We have entire sectors of our economy that we call teachers and psychologists and therapists and psychiatrists and public health officials, all of whom are constantly trying to change people's behavior. And they are some of the most frustrated human beings on the planet. I've been several of those things. I am one of the most frustrated human beings on the planet. Had I been a perfect teacher, which I was not, the best I could do was improve my students' reading level by 1.5 years. That is, if you're in first grade, the best thing I could get you to was halfway through second grade. Well, I had a student who came to my classroom as a sixth grader who was reading on a kindergarten level. If he improved the max Every year, maybe, and everyone did everything perfectly, maybe by the time he graduated, he would read it on grade level, but probably not, because behavior change is incredibly difficult. Next to impossible. It is really hard to break your own bad habits. It is even harder to break the bad habits of another person. So I find it deeply meaningful. This is not a sermon about how you're going to lose weight. I just, or maybe it is, but this is a sermon about how God's going to change your life. Or God has the power to change your life. As hard as behavior change is, as hard as it is for a person to do the things they need to do to turn their life around, stories of lives that get turned around are one of the hallmarks of the Christian faith. And if you're asking me, and then people do, when people come at me, look, where's the proof that all of this is real? Where's the proof that any of this means anything? I point to those stories of life turnaround. Because those stories of life turnaround are as unlikely a story as any to be told because of how hard life turnaround, that level of change is. It is really important to me that when we talk about what the Christian faith is, we are not just about punching a ticket to a celestial home. Yes, there is a celestial home. And yes, by believing in Christ, you do get to go there. But there's this other thing that we claim. This other thing that we claim is that the faith we live 
transforms our lives in the here and now. Jesus often used the phrase bearing fruit, right? That the work of God in our lives doesn't just bear fruit and that we don't burn forever in some celestial, some, you know, subterranean pit of fire. Instead, it bears fruit in our lives right now. And that's what a scripture like James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 is trying to get at. This idea that the faith we carry within us, this belief that is within us, does something to us to transform us. What is good? This is verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Yes, we are saved by faith. Absolutely. Bible, very clear on this. We're saved by faith. But that faith is supposed to do something to you. That the belief in God is supposed to transform you. That the belief in God is supposed to change your life. Change you into something else. Change you into a better person. That you can look back and say, hey, I am not that person I was before. I may not still be the person I need to be. I have these thoughts all the time. Sometimes about myself, often about y'all. You are not the people. <laughs> More often about me than you. Uh, I'm not the person yet maybe I need to be. But I am certainly not the person that I was. And Paul is the archetype of that exact story. Because when we first meet Paul, Paul is a mess. Because we don't first meet Paul at the beginning of chapter 9. No, we first meet Paul with the stoning of Stephen. Um, I did notice first service, and I picked this piece of art and realized that man appears to be throwing a rugby ball and not a rock. That is not a rock. Or if that is a rock, that man is winning the lifting championship because that has got to be one heavy rock. Yeah, that one, the one that's going to hit the laser right now, that is either the largest coconut or watermelon I've ever seen um, or a rugby ball. But he, he was told to bring a rock, and he got the memo wrong, and he brought the wrong thing. I don't know what it is. Everyone else is throwing potatoes, and he is throwing watermelon. Anyways, it's all very strange. Medieval art was a real weird time. We meet Paul the Stoning of Stephen, where all these people are determined to do a tremendous amount of violence to an early, follow, early and outspoken follower of Jesus. And Paul is the guy sitting there at center of screen, approving of everything that they were doing and watching their coats to make sure none of their coats got stolen while they threw rocks at Stephen till he died. And so that's where we pick up with verses 1 and 2. This was not a floke. Paul really is very determined uh, to uh, end Christianity by any means necessary. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem where presumably they're going to do to them the same thing they did to Stephen, the same thing they did to Jesus, the same thing they did to James the Lesser, right? This is a real bloody period where people are trying to get Christians in a bodily and murderous way. That's when we meet Paul. Yes, is he devout? Maybe to his own detriment he's devout. But his belief is so misguided that he sees the best way to follow God is to kill those who are doing the best that they can to follow God. So he's pretty far from where God needs him to be. And so it is at that point, letters in hand, you know, essentially arrest warrants for Christians in hand, that Paul sets out on the road to Damascus and has this striking and transformative experience where, you know, he sees Christ, he hears the voice, he's struck blind, Christ essentially looks at him and goes, what are you doing? Literally, what are you doing? Try again. Then he enters into this time of fasting and he enters in, 
you know, he clearly, something sinks in because he gets to Damascus, he's blind, he's fasting, he's praying, and then God calls Ananias, right? And so Ananias shows up, right? So Paul, you know, this four days have passed since Paul set out from uh, Jerusalem to Damascus. Um, in, in four days ago, he was all ready to kill Christians so much that he did the paperwork to get the arrest warrant. Now, four days later, he's blind. He's sitting in the house of a man named Judas. God, there are a lot of Judases in the Bible. Uh, sitting with a man in a man named Judas's house. Ananias comes in. You got a feel for Ananias, right? Like he knows that Paul can have him killed. And he goes, anyways, I wish I were as brave as Ananias. And so that's where we get the moment that makes Paul, Paul. And that is verses 17 through 20. So when Ananias went and entered the house, he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God. That last line in particular, I think is really important. If you think about what happened in this man's life over the course of less than four full days. Four days ago, he was leaving Jerusalem armed with arrest warrants for the people who followed Jesus. It was called then the way. Flash forward four days, he is preaching to Jews in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. This is a vast amount of change, a huge amount of life change for four days. It's amazing. It is literally miraculous in that on our own, on his own, couldn't do it. But Christ directly, very directly intervened in his life. And that encounter with Christ transformed him to such a degree that he goes from persecutor to preacher in four days. That's one heck of a self-improvement plan. Yeah, real fast tracked. Doesn't always happen that fast. It's po all it's possible for all of us. Just no, it's maybe not always four days. I think really needed Paul. And Paul's not the only one for whom that happened. Right? If Paul is the only story, if this is still a meaningful story, well, the New Testament is full of these kinds of stories. You think about even Peter, right? Just think about slightly earlier in the gospel slash the beginning of Acts. Uh, Peter goes from when uh, pushed about whether he believed in Jesus or not on the night in which Jesus died and gives himself up. He's standing by the fire. He, he repeatedly says, I don't know him. I, I, I don't know him. It's scary. I, I don't know him. I'm terrified. You know, flash forward 50 days. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. The same people are out to get him. The same people are out to kill him. It's, uh, no, nothing has changed other than he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. He stands up. He preaches publicly. And 3,000 are saved that day. That's a heck of a amount of life change for 50 days. To go from denying Christ to then being willing to publicly preach Christ to repeatedly getting arrested for Christ and never wavering again in his faith. You even think of the Old Testament. You think about someone like King David. He wandered pretty far from God. Saw his need for change. And continued as a king after God's own heart. And I admit that it's these kinds of stories that have always carried a lot of weight for me. These are the kinds of stories that I can both see in the Bible and see in the world around me. That I can read about in the pages of the Bible about a man named Saul. Maybe when I get to heaven, I'll get to meet him. But I'll, I've never got to meet that guy. 
that I can hear his story, and then I can hear the stories of other people that sound a lot like that and see that something that was happening in the Bible is happening in our world today and in the same ways. When I was struggling to find my faith at the age of 19, I'm walking this pilgrimage route across Spain, and I got to know four people who walked with me, a guy named Thomas, a guy named Marcos, and a guy named Peter. And all three of them, as we walked along, told these stories about how they were doing something else, something clearly God didn't want them to do. God intervened in their lives, and it changed, right? Peter was an incredibly wealthy executive for Sony of Ireland. I don't know, making all kinds of money, doing all kinds of show business junk. I have no idea what that job is. But God spoke to him so clearly and so loudly that he quit that job, walked away from the money, and was becoming a high school teacher because that's where God needed him to be. Thomas and Marcos had been comfortable American college students until God spoke into their lives, and then they were both going on a multi-year mission to the Confederated States of Micronesia. I know that's the Pacific Ocean. Where? Who knows? They were about to live there. And here I was, Wondering if God was real or just in books. And here were three people who told me their story of not doing, not being who God wanted them to be. God intervening and becoming who God wanted them to be, of actually changing their lives. And so in my own moments of doubt, I look back at those stories. I think of the stories of the people around me, the people in this room whose stories I know. And I think about what God has done in my own life and how I have been transformed from that time as a, as a you know, doubt-filled 19-year-old to a 35-year-old pastor who's getting by. And these stories are everything. One of the joys I have in my life is I get to be the, for another month, I get to be the chairman of the board of Rock Bottom Ranch, this recovery ministry uh, that I do some success in the ranch for, but the recovery ministry here in the Palestine community. One of the reasons it is one of the great joys of my life is Rock Bottom Ranch is a pure distillation of these kinds of stories. It is a story founded by someone who was not on the right path, who God spoke to, and who found the right path. And it is bringing in a whole bunch of women who are deeply in their addiction and deeply in their struggles, repeated times in jail, prison, jail, prison, jail, prison, and they come to Rock Bottom Ranch for a year, which in the grand scheme of life is not all that long. And so many of them walk out transformed people, boldly declaring what God has done for them. It sounds a whole heck of a lot like Paul. It's one of those stories that you can read in the Bible, and then you can see happening in the world today. And so when I'm looking for proof, of the reality of God. When I need that reminder that what we are doing here is real and alive, I remember that I am not who I was. I remember that Saul was not who he was. I remember the ladies of Rock Bottom Ranch are not what they were, that none of us are. That carries a lot of weight with me. But God can do the impossible in our lives, actually make us change. We spend $1.5 trillion trying to lose weight, and it ain't working. But you bow down on your knees. You welcome God into your heart. You really can be changed. You see it happen all the time. That's my proof of God's reality. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forth from this place empowered by this encounter with you to not just let you into our own lives, but to see how you have transformed the lives of those around us. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.